All right, so welcome to chapter one, EMS systems. Hold on for a sec. Hello? Yes. No, we're doing the uh, social distancing. Oh, with distance education, I don't have to wear a mask? Okay, all right, well, thank you. Okay, well, sorry for that interruption. We just wanna make sure we're keeping you all safe. So jumping into chapter one, EMS systems. So, here we go. The chapter one is, and recognized with our program, the textbook is the where all the answers are going to come from. Okay, if there's ever something we need to refer back, back to, that's gonna come from your textbook. And recognizing EMS is a system, right? It's not just one component. There's ambulances, there's dispatchers, there's hospitals, definitive care, public education. I mean, there's a lot of components within the system. So understand this course is designed to get you prepared to take the national registry exam. The system itself, team of healthcare professionals, as an EMT, you may work with a paramedic, you may work with another EMT, but you're gonna transport patients to, again, different facilities, could be dialysis, it could be emergency rooms, but all of those create our team. And who oversees that? This is gover governed by the state, right? If you're at this point, you've most likely created, and if you haven't, it's a good time to remember to do that, your online account with the Arizona Department of Health Services. Those are the ones that give us the approval to run these classes alongside our medical director. But again, that's who allows us to put on this class for you. The completion of this course, and we'll talk a little bit more about this because it's not just take the course, go take NREMT and you're good that how this works is there's the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians, right? They write the test. And after successful completion of that written exam, you are then eligible to apply back to the state of Arizona, and then you can receive your certificate. There's also the practical skills portion. And the practical skills portion include things such as the medical assessment, trauma assessment, the AED, the bag valve mask, there's uh, tourniquets or bleeding control, long bone immobilization, joint immobilization. So there are a lot of skills that we have to complete also. But the textbook, the lectures, these are all designed to get you through what we refer to as the didactic portion. Now, there's different levels of training. And in this course, you're most likely enrolled in the EMT 100, could also be our EMT 110, which is more of a prep course for 100. But let's look at the different levels here real quick. And as we go through EMR down to the paramedic, each one of these will be looked at individually. So we'll go through those in a sec. But the different learning activities that this course will be providing to you, obviously we want you to read the book. Okay, you will not pass the class if you do not read the book. We have lectures such as this where we'll go through the PowerPoints. Again, PowerPoints are things you're all gonna have access to as well, but we wanna make sure we have discussions about this material, right? Someone just reading you this slide and then thinking everything's okay or that you won't develop questions from that, we understand that. So again, time in class to do that as well as potentially some uh, online office hours that we'll set up for you. The step-by-step -step demonstrations as you look through the book, there's also these things called the uh, skill drills that just helps you build that muscle memory, why I'm doing this skill, why this is so important. Those will be things as we evolve through the uh, program. The case presentations and scenarios in giving you a patient who may have difficulty breathing and you find out about their history. Oh, they have COPD. Well, why is COPD going to lead to this difficulty breathing, right? And scenarios are things such as running calls. Again, those are things we can create in you know, multiple modalities or mediums for you. So we'll try and capture all those different types of learners that I know we have in this course. The, EMTs and never, never call someone just an EMT. Okay, the EMT is that backbone of the EMS system. When, you know, we consider the United States 
how many paramedics there are versus how many EMTs, there's always going to be more EMTs out there. Uh, EMTs and what you're going to be doing, that emergency care and transportation to the sick and injured. It's in the title of the book. Care and transportation of the sick and injured. Again, and that doesn't always mean that the top one here, that they're in a life-threatening situation. It could be just supportive care or oxygen, and you're transporting someone from a hospital bed, potentially to dialysis, right? That is just as important as providing the life-saving care that you will do as well. So we look at our, and this is always something that, that gets me on the licensure requirement. Arizona, technically you're certified, right? You're a certified emergency medical care technician. Again, just terminology that's gonna be used throughout the course. So what you actually need to do in Arizona, and this was part of that onboarding process, is we wanna verify your reading score, ensure that yes, I have a high school diploma, great. The immunizations become so important because you're gonna deal potentially with going into hospitals, whether that's in a clinical setting or that when it's your actual job, they're gonna to wanna to make sure that you don't have the potential not only to catch something, but to spread that to someone else. Remember, a lot of our clientele, if you will, are suffering from some compromised immune system issue, they have respiratory issues, and again, something that we could pass on to them is gonna be bad for everyone. So the background check and the drug screen, yes, right? You're getting into a profession where you're not gonna be you know, utilizing drugs on, on the weekend and then just go back to work, right? Again, there's, there's other reasons why that's done. But obviously having a valid driver's license is important. Well, why? Because you will most likely be driving the ambulance as well. The completion of the required course and certification exam. That is this course. I know later on it tells you that a EMT course generally runs about 150 hours. The state requirement is technically 130, but we do a lot more than that. There are things that you'll complete online, There's, again, things that we need to do with you in person, but our course has always exceeded those minimal hour requirements. And when asked why, why is this you know, so necessary, is because number one, you are the backbone of the EMS system, and two, it, this is our community, right? We wanna make sure that the providers out there can you know, be the smartest, be the best, the premier providers, and continue to provide that service, not only for the, the public, but potentially ourselves as well. So some of the other things, making sure the mental, mental and physical ability to do the job, right? There are certain strength requirements that will uh, need to confirm or verify the other state, local and employer provisions, right? Employers can provide or require different things than we may as the educational institution, but those are all things that are available on you know, multiple websites, again, so you know what you're getting into. The ADA Act is something that is recognized as well, meaning if there's some potential disability that you have and you can still do the job with what's called a reasonable accommodation, then you're still eligible to work in this field. Background checks, again, just want to make sure that you're, you know, all not convicted felons or certain crimes that will make you ineligible to be an EMT. So those are the things you've discussed with uh, uh, Yolanda, Heather, or Cole. If those questions did come up, if you got something right now that's burning in the back of your head, I'm going to tell you call uh, the State of Arizona Department of Health Services and make sure that this is something you can complete. So looking at the EMS system now, getting into it the volunteer ambulances in World War I, right? We can move up to field care in World War II. Field care is a little different because instead of just scooping someone up and, and running, you know, maybe they could actually do something, stop some bleeding, put some pressure on that. And it continued down to the uh, NASH units when you look at Korea and mobile army surgical hospitals. So someone didn't have to be flowing out four hours to potentially getting some life-saving surgery, but maybe they could do it relatively closer to that initial scene. This paper, 1966, Accidental Death and Disability, The Neglected Disease of Modern Society, 
once we get back into class, I have excerpts of that outside all of the testing rooms, just kind of his, uh, the history behind this was uh, pretty incredible. So again, be familiar with that paper. You don't have to read the entirety of the paper, but you do have to understand that it recognized that we needed more care here at home when, when people were injured. And there's a whole history through television and film about this. So I, I won't steal any of that thunder. I'll let you kind of do some of that on your own. The uh, Department of Transportation published the first EMT training curriculum, the things that they were allowed to do with, of course, the medical director's supervision. And in 1971, the first edition of this. Again, this is the book. This is what we will, will refer to during the class. And it's some 1,500 pages, a little bit more than that if you're reading through the glossary. But again, make sure you have this textbook. There, Kind of fun things. I, I think I took this course when we were on the seventh edition, and there may have been 600 pages in that book. So over the course of time, there's more information that the EMTs are required to know, right? This is not just, oh, look, there's someone who's bleeding. Let's put a Band-Aid on that. The physiology, the pathophysiology, medications, all the things that uh, really make someone a good clinician. This is a profession. And you should be expected to, you know, act like a professional and, of course, know that there are some, you know, stringent requirements behind this. The standardization efforts, again, so we might have had one state who could do this and then another EMT could do things completely different. So now, when we're on the National Highway Transportation and Safety Administration EMS agenda for the future, you know, that also recognizes the, the mental health aspects of the job. Okay? That resiliency training is something we've done for many, many semesters here. And now the state is just slowly starting to catch up and put that into some of the requirements. Still not a requirement, but important enough that we want to make sure that you are aware of some of the potential pitfalls of this profession and what you can do to make sure that you keep everyone including yourself, safe. The uh, levels of training, again, from federal down to the local, I, you should all be familiar with something called your NIMS training, National Incident Management System. That's an example of a federal level of training at the state. These are your EMS operations. Again, the, when you look at chapter three, because I just finished that with Peter's lecture, I saw he was referring to the, on the state website, your permissive skills, right? What you can actually do. And that's available at DHS. It's also available at SAEMS, which is the Southern Arizona Emergency Medical Services. But all of those are things that your employer will make you familiar with. There's not a, you know, we're not gonna throw you out in the middle of this situation and that not be within your scope of practice. So again, we'll, we'll make you comfortable with all those regulations and the tasks you're actually able to perform. At the local level, your medical director. If it comes down to it and you have a question, even on a test we have, if you are uncomfortable, what do you do? You contact meds control, right? Meds control is the agency or the person that can authorize you to perform something. I know later on, we're gonna look at the difference between online and offline or standing orders and protocols. I'll definitely talk a little bit more about that. So how that level of training all overlap at some point in here, right? Medical direction, that's your day-to-day -day operation. You know, the state office, that was, again, where you had to put in your name. So that's how we give you course credit with the Department of Health Services and creating that account. And when you look down at the EMS scope of practice, keep in mind, we also follow the national guidelines, right? The national guidelines are the scope of practice. And Arizona recognizes that, which is why when you get done, you will sit for our final exam. You will sit for the national registry exam. And once you pass that, in addition to the skills portion, then you will receive your Arizona certification. So, and I want to look at this as well, public BLS and immediate aid. So there are millions of people trained in CPR. The BLS stands for basic life support CPR. Basic life support is what you were trained in to enter this class. The biggest difference between that 
and I'm not going to refer to a lay person as a BLS provider. They typically take through AHA, it's called the Heart Saver CPR. Heart Saver does the mouth to mouth. Right now, obviously, the focus is on compression only CPR. But what the biggest difference in there is the bag valve mass, right? You did a CPR class, you should have looked at a bag valve mask for your two person CPR. There's a pocket mask that has the one way valve that you would breathe into. I really don't look at the mouth to mouth as a BLS provider. So what they've also done, and this is through the research and the science, is increase the number of AEDs that are available. Automated external defibrillators is a device that actually can defibrillate the heart it's only two rhythms that it will recognize, ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia. But these things are so important. You see them now in grocery stores. You, you, know, you see them at the Costco. Or the movie theater has these things. So that's called public access defibrillation because it was recognized that if you can defibrillate someone roughly about the first two minutes, then that person has about a 50% survival rate. There's not a lot of fire departments or EMS agencies at, at for a matter of fact, that will be able to get to someone in two minutes. So they put up these AEDs in these strategic locations, if you will, and if someone does go into cardiac arrest, bam, they put the AED on. AEDs are simple to use. You turn it on, follow prompts, hit the shock button if indicated. But again, that should be something you remember from your CPR class. But that's part of the public life-saving efforts and immediate aid, right? If they could deliver this life-saving care, they should do it, right? And there are ways to keep yourself safe, even if it's compression only CPR, calling 911. Now we're getting into the chain of survival for American Heart, but those are all great things. The, now this was the, where I told you we're gonna go through each of those, the EMR, down to the paramedic in a little bit more detail. So when you look at the EMR, emergency medical responders, there is a certification that is available for that. There's a, skills portion, just like the EMT class, and there is a national exam that you sit for. But again, this course is not designed to get you through that process. It's to get you more comfortable heading into the 100 class, if that's something that you're in, or it's able to just give you this basic or core knowledge of what's going on, right? How can you help someone? Because there's Good Samaritan laws, now, I don't want to get too much into chapter three, but you'll see about that as well. So who typically is an EMR? Could be a cop, could be firefighters in different regions. This is where when we look at the national versus the state, all firefighters in Arizona are minimum trained at an EMT level. So where this comes in could be back east, again, different places where they do that. Now, smaller Departments may allow EMRs, but they're also working with an EMT who's going to provide a lot of those skills. But they do the BLS care, right? They can use limited equipment. But again, this is awesome. Is why do you need such personnel like this? Is that BLS care or a higher level of care is often delayed, but now the EMR can at least start that care until help arrives. When you look at the EMT, right? Requires about 150 hours. Again, even with the summer notes that we looked at, we'll still have you somewhere around the 180 to 200 hour range. Now, you'll do basic life support. There's basic life support and there's advanced life support. Save advanced life support for the next two slides we look at. But what, what do you do? And there's some descriptions of the traits that are necessary to be an EMT, but you do the patient assessment, you do the, you know, actually administer care package, and package means get them, you know, on the stretcher or potentially a spine board, and actually transporting. Again, that's why you need to have a driver's license, because you could be driving the, the ambulance. In the AEMT, not as many advanced emergency medical technicians, there you know, was a push to either go down or up the cert level, and that's fine. But what the AMT was able to do at that time, the IV therapy, certain adjuncts, but only a certain number of medications, right? They couldn't give every medication that was in the paramedic drug box, and that is 
The next or the highest level of pre-hospital care is the paramedic. And somewhere between you know, 1,000, this will tell you 1,300, but it wouldn't be uncommon to go 2,000 or 1,500 hours for a paramedic course. You know, the things that are included in that. And no, since you will have a Q&A time on this, if something like endotracheal innovation, you're like, well, what is endotracheal innovation? Make a note of that. And, and obviously, we want to clear this up for you. But you can also use the Google and look up endotracheal innovation if you don't know what that is. Again, this is so important. This is like a, a basic math class. And by the time we get to the end, we're going to be doing you know, vector calculus. So if you don't know, please ask or, or, or look it up, and we can certainly clarify that for you. Uh, different medications that are carried in the paramedic drug box. Again, this is the full list. It's an inclusive list of everything that they can carry based on the state's permissive skills. And of course, your medical director. Cardiac monitoring is different from an AED. The cardiac monitor actually puts the leads on the chest. You look at the P, the QRS, and the T wave, and you're doing some interpretation of those EKGs. But for an EMT, it's just I don't want to say it's just, but it's the AED that you utilize. You won't be doing the cardiac monitoring, but later when we get to, I think it's chapter 40, the ALS assist, you do have to have a fundamental knowledge of that. So how you and your partner can actually work as a cohesive unit. So the components of the EMS system, these will be broken down individually as we go through them. So I'm just going to click through the first couple of slides for you. And then again, each of these is broken down and we'll see what they're used for. Why is this important? So when you start looking at the system itself, again, we can look at incident recognition. This ties in with the chain of survival, early access, calling 911 and, oh look, I access 911. Well, who's gonna answer the phone at 911? That's gonna be your dispatcher. And maybe the cops show up first, so you get a first responder and then the EMT or the paramedics show up, right? You can include all those down here, and then you transport. There's a couple of different ways to transport a patient. It could be by helicopter, it could also be by a ground unit. There are some, and there we have this fixed wing flights that you know fly with a paramedic or even a nurse. Here, we get them to the emergency department, right? That's where our goal is, is to get them there as quickly and as safely as we can. But Give me an example of, oh, this patient had a stroke, okay? They had a stroke. And when they get done at the emergency department, maybe they're set to go into the ICU, but then they go to some type of specialty care clinic, right? Some stroke rehab facility. And there you are. Get to rehab, do what they have to do. Prevention awareness, right? Why, why do we spend time on prevention or awareness? Because the person that you know potentially had this stroke, maybe it's going to be advisable that they eliminate you know some sodium from their diet. Maybe they need to decrease the stress in their life. But again, that just ties again to your public education is we don't want to see the same patients for the same thing time and time again when there is a potential. I don't want to say it a fix, but maybe there's a potential for a reduction of harm for those patients. So, so I tell you, we'll spend a little more time on each of those. The 911 system, dispatchers. Dispatchers are awesome. We have a bunch of dispatchers that work for us, and they are fantastic. And you cannot get the job done without a good dispatcher. That's just how it is. They're keeping track of multiple things at the same time. Now, what else do those dispatchers do? The EMD, emergency medical dispatch, allows for them to talk to the person who's on the other end of that line and give them the instructions for CPR, right? Is your, is your patient breathing? Well, how do I know if they're breathing? And they'll tell them, tilt the head back. Okay, no, look for 10 seconds. They're not breathing. Tell you how to do compressions, take the shirt off, put your hands in the center of the chest, press hard and fast 100 to 120 times a minute. So dispatchers are awesome and every component in this system is awesome but a uh, little special shout out for our dispatchers the critical clinical care clinical care you are a clinician we hope to train you to be excellent clinicians but that's dealing with the equipment that's on your ambulance knowing your primary service area again that's the area that you typically respond within 
it can change, but you're typically designated to a certain area of a town. The human resources, yeah, they focus on the people that are delivering your care. See, when we look down here, the EMS agenda for the future, this doesn't come till probably after mod five, which is trauma, but we are gonna do some resiliency training, right? Things to look for, things to recognize. There could be some pretty, you know, bad calls that you have and you need to recognize there are resources available for you to, you know, talk through that, whatever you need to do to get, you know, on to the next day. And it's avoiding the drugs, the alcohol, the negative things. There's some very positive things you can do to eliminate your stressors. Medical direction. Again, we have to have a medical director, right? In order to practice, that is, always think of it as the medical director is the one who's allowing you to perform the skills that, that you are due. The medical director acts as a liaison. Again, we have a medical director at the state who works with our physician medical director to discuss what things would be appropriate and what skills you should be able to provide. Now, the standing orders and protocols, this is the first time you're probably actually seeing this, but this will come up. I just know that from mod one, when we look at standing orders and protocols, standing orders are algorithms that have been put in place that you can do without contacting the base hospital right away. And there's still going to be a need to contact that base hospital. When we look at protocols, just the, the things that you're allowed to do. Medical director, again, here we get to online versus offline. So if you're offline, it means you can't call into the hospital. Right? I can't call somebody and say, hey, this is my patient. What should I do with them? So CPR is a great example. And it, it's actually the first example in the review of this portion but you find a patient who's in cardiac arrest. Okay, well, what do you do? You check the breathing pulse, you can make sure the scene is safe, you're gonna start CPR and put the AED on as soon as your, your partner brings that to you. That is offline, right? Does it make sense that, oh, look, this patient's in cardiac arrest. Hold on, let, let, me, let me find out, should I, what should I do, right? So there are assumptions that you need to know what to do. And, that's why there's online and offline medical control. Legislation, the uh, regulations in here, there are laws, right? There are laws that we have which tell us your scope of practice. When you look at the scheduling, personnel, budgets, purchasing, vehicle maintenance, again, those are things for really senior EMS officials to worry about, but again, they are all part of the system. Integration of health services. And I believe it's called TC3. This is Tucson Fire Department's way of uh, utilizing community paramedicine. So there is some of that that it's certainly going on in this community. But we recognize that an integration of healthcare service, if you've not heard the word integration in relationship to healthcare, you've probably been living underneath a rock. So integration just makes sure we bring all of these things together. So the patient can have the best outcome. New methods for delivering healthcare. I, I kind of jumped ahead on my uh, community paramedicine, but it's actually a, a real exciting part within the system that it makes sure that that healthcare is provided within the community by a, I don't call them a separate team of professionals, but paramedics receive advanced training to provide services within a community. Right, that's community paramedicine. What can that do? It can do any number of things. It can decrease the amount of times that this person was seen in actual emergency department. Why is that important? You know, think of this on a finance level, right? If this person's going into the hospital, you know, every three days because they are a diabetic and they're not controlling their sugar, and at this time they get back up to what's called diabetic ketoacidosis, that's a lot of trips to the hospital. So are there ways that we can use these mobile integrated healthcare outlets to you know, decrease their opportunities to returning? Maybe there's more education that people need on this subject. So just another way to increase the availability of good healthcare to all citizens. An evaluation, 
this is super important as well, that CQI, continuous quality improvement, has one goal, right? It is not a punitive thing, but it is actually set up to minimize errors, right? Minimize errors, minimizing errors. The minimization of errors is the goal of any continuous quality improvement system, CQI. Information systems, again, you may use computers to actually input patient care, the care that you provided. Uh, some agencies still use pen to paper where you're actually doing a patient care report, PCRs. Again, these are gonna come up in chapter three where it's uh, about medical, legal, ethical considerations. Again, I think documentation might actually be four, but document, document, document. I'll tell you right now, if you don't write it down, the assumption is that it never happened. So documentation, really exciting and important chapter as well. System finance, well, when you look at the different organizations that are out there, the private organizations, okay, private organization is AMR, American Medical Response. Look them up, Google them, they're in town. They're a great uh, opportunity for employment for our graduates. Fire departments as well are providing that EMS service. Tucson Fire, Tucson Fire responds in the city. Again, rural metro is outside, but rural metro is private versus DFD, that is actually the city's fire department. Uh, third party services, hospitals that provide that transport, it might not be you know, always emergency medical services, maybe this patient just needs oxygen. So again, there's different ways that people get transported, but finance, well, yeah, that's the money. This is so important because you, will have to get insurance information if possible, right? Secure your signatures. I have gotten calls, it's been a long time, but at two o'clock in the morning from somebody looking over a report that says, hey, you didn't get a signature. Okay, if you don't get a signature, just remember the term PUTS, P-U-T-S, patient unable to sign. And if you just transported someone who is in cardiac arrest, you right, don't put the pen in his hand and, right? PUTS, you just gotta PUTS that person. Again, just means that they're not able to sign your form, but it is also advisable to put a reason why, right? But cardiac arrest, that gets you call at two in the morning, then the other person on the other end of that line needs some remedial training. But obviously this is a, it's a business, right? People need to get paid. Doesn't mean it's gonna come out of their pocket, but we put that back on the insurance for the person. Now, as far as educational systems, hey, that's us, we're a part of this. EMS instructors, yeah, there are certain levels of certification and training that all of the presenters that you will see on one chapter one through chapter 41 all have to maintain the programs. And again, I'm governed by the Department of Health Services. There's also the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians and our medical director that ensure that we're maintaining as high a level in the program as we can. So. ALS, Advanced Life Support, these are your paramedic training programs. A lot of those are put out through the college, right? They're, U of A used to offer that. Unfortunately, they're no longer in the game, but there are multiple places where an ALS certification can get uh, achieved or the paramedic training. Continuing education. Again, when you complete this class, continuing education is something you will always need to do. National Registry has 40 hours that they require. It's 20 hours, 10, and 10 in different subject areas. Arizona only requires you 24 hours to maintain your certification, typically through continuing education courses, refreshers. Again, there, there are ways you can do that, maintaining your continued education without having to take a separate refresher course. But again, that's why there's, there's options that are available. But, Always, always going to recommend from day one, maintain your national registry, okay? And, and here's an example of why that's important. Fed students come from a different state. They have their national registry certification. All we would be required to do with them is 24 hours of their continuing education. It's the system based loosely on this reciprocity. And if you have your Arizona certification, national certification, not just the state, and you decide to move to Montana, you know, 
again, it's likely that you will only need to take a refresher course instead of taking the entire course over again. That's the big benefit of having that national registry education and certification. So again, always encourage you to hold on to that cert. Prevention and public education. All right, there's different examples of our primary and secondary prevention. We'll look through the you know, public education and some old examples of what was actually done with that, and, and that's this, right? The putting fluoride in the water, okay? So I'm probably a little older than you are. I remember being in third grade, and they would teach you would call us up to a sink. They'd give you a little fluoride, and, and you spit that out. But now do they put that in the water? Does that decrease the incidence of tooth decay? Is that better for people? There's also examples here when we think about seatbelt laws, right? Seatbelt laws, I think Arizona was using the click it or ticket. Well, why? Because passengers or drivers that are in an automobile accident, we're going to call them crashes later, and have seatbelts on are less likely to go flying out the windshield or have mass trauma, which leads to increase in hospitalization, not to mention there's death involved in that. So again, it's just things that are done, put in place to really protect the community. EMS research, there's a lot of things that we derive from EMS research. The example I gave you earlier about the AEDs and CPR, you know, AEDs are awesome, CPR is awesome. But when those two are put together, that increases the patient's chances of survival. So it does help shape what you're doing and the protocols that we have. The evidence-based medicine and evidence-based practice is something you will hear a lot of. And you might not even think about this you know, as an EMT, but what is your role in EMS research? Well, every first care report that you write, that's data, right? And that data can be recorded so it's just in, in keeping with doing good reports, right? making sure if you make an error, you line through it, you put your initials next to it. But that's how just a simple first care or patient care report can be gathering data and lead to this evidence-based practice in medicine. So I looked at these roles and responsibilities of the EMT. So the job, let's call this the what you're getting in your what you're getting yourself into. Okay, these are some, this is not an all-inclusive list, some of these more than others. So I'll give the first one, keep the vehicle and equipment ready. You are not expected to go out and change the oil and you know all these other things, but you, you are gonna need to know how to check the oil, you're gonna need to know how to check the fluids, you're gonna make sure the, the lights are working, you know, it all comes down to safety. So ensure safety. Me, I come first my partner, the patient, and then the public. So again, you always, there's this just safety mindset that we always have to have. Operating the emergency vehicle, something that we're unfortunately not running currently is our uh, ambulance operation course. There's certain ways that you navigate through. One's called a serpentine, doing that in reverse. How do you parallel park an ambulance? But uh, it's been my experience that will also be available at your current employer because it's ultimately up to the employer to say, yes, we recognize that you are a safe driver. Now we're going to let you be our employee. On-scene leader and scene evaluation, of course, call for additional resources. This is in one of the first five or six steps of a medical and, and trauma assessment sheet that you'll see. And, and more importantly, don't just know that because it's part of the sheet, right? Oh, call for additional resources. Well, why is calling for additional resources important? Well, if you have a two-vehicle MVA and both of your patients have bilateral femur fractures, you've got two critical patients. You are only to deal with one critical patient. Doesn't mean you just leave that other patient there, but what do you need? You need additional resources. Why? Because what you have on hand is something that is greater than your ability to just take care of by yourself or with your partner. Gaining patient access. So I want to say this is chapter 38, simple versus complex access. Simply the complex just means you use a tool to gain entry into a vehicle. This should all be done with the proper safety gear. Doing a patient assessment, medical assessment. 
trauma patient. I know we're just talking about this now, but those are all things that you have to look forward to, as those are pretty exciting parts of this, this entire class. Give the emergency medical care while waiting for additional resources. Okay, all right, there's my two patients. What can I do for them? Well, I'm going to do the best I can until the additional resources arrive. We're not just going to sit around and say, wow, someone should probably stop that bleeding. Right, put your tourniquet on. Things you can definitely do in the meantime. The uh, Give emotional support. I'm not asking you to be a therapist or anything, but there is some you know, common human decency that goes along with this job. So that's where the emotional support comes in. And this could be to your partner. It could be to others that you work with. Of course, it could be to the patient or their families as well. The continuity of care just ensures that what you start is going to continue on at the hospital. That's why it's so important for you to start the right care. Because of course, that's going to be continued by your uh, emergency room doctors and nurses and paramedics and everyone else that you're handing the patient on to. The medical and legal standards and as far as upholding those, uh, example for that is obligated reporter laws, right? If you suspect someone's suffering abuse at someone's, you have to report that. That's an example of some of the medical or the actually the legal standards there. Patient privacy, the HIPAA laws aren't, we don't give information to those that, number one, don't have a signed release or aren't in the, quote, need to know, right? Don't take your patient into the hospital and not tell the nurse anything until she signs off on the form, right? That's a need to know basis in there. The administrative support, this is why you want to do those run reports. It's all important. It all is a big cycle, as we saw, because if you can't afford to pay the employees, because we never get the insurance information, then that's going to grind to a halt. So even something as simple as doing the reports is actually administrative support. The uh, professional development, yeah, I tell you all, when you start this class, this is you know only the beginning, right? You're only going to learn more from this point on. You're only going to, again, increase your, your knowledge and your skill base and become awesome clinicians. At the same time, you're also going to increase that didactic knowledge of, of the body and patients and also deal with anything that has changed. Right, my professional development example is, oh, when we went to class, we didn't use tourniquets. Now tourniquets is recognized one of the first line you know, ways to control life-threatening bleeds. So if you didn't update or continue in that professional development, you wouldn't know it, and then your patient could have a negative outcome, and that would not be good. The sustained community relations, again, there's a certain level that goes with wearing you know, that badge or that shirt, whatever it is that will recognize you to others as what you're doing. So you'll go out into the community, and this could be as part of a tour, you give tours to kids at your facility, but that's just building those good relationships within the community. And, and that also ties along with giving back to the profession. So the professional attributes, again, there's an expectation, right? If you call, 911 you expect a certain uniform for the for the personnel to have on you know your integrity you're empathetic and of course appropriate to do so you're self-motivated individuals parents and hygiene is important why well just because it is and there's self-confidence there's a difference between self-confidence and cocky cocky is not what we're looking for we're looking for those self-confident people that can come in and, and manage scenes which normal people probably wouldn't be able to. The time management, well, time management is definitely a key. Most of you are probably procrastinators and like the hands-on stuff, but again, you're just gonna have to learn how to you know, juggle everything that goes within the day-to-day -day operations of, a, of an EMS facility. Same thing's gonna go with class, right? You're gonna have to you know, get these lectures done, you're gonna read the material, there's so much that goes into this, but that's just honestly prepping you for that, that real world of EMS. Teamwork and diplomacy, right? You might not have the same partner every day, but you're still gonna have to work together with that individual the best you can. And you're diplomatic, you don't, you know, it, it may be three o'clock in the morning and this person called you because they stubbed their toe and now the, the nail's bleeding a little bit. Okay, well, to us that's probably down here on the scale but for that person 
right? We're, we're going to be respectful to them. We're going to take care of them the best we can because saying is, hey, if they call 911, that's their emergency. So even though you may have years and years of experience, still remember why they called you, right? And advocacy deals with making sure the patients get the right care. They're not, you know, this is an abuse patient. Make sure we call for the right uh, agencies or do the right reporting. And of course, your careful delivery of care. So I think I've hit that enough about the compassion and respect for others. Again, that's just always do the best for every patient. HIPAA and that confidentiality, again, I'm not going to repeat, you know, information. Yeah, I can give not names, but maybe an example of the case. That's awesome. But you can't say, hey, I responded to Joe Schmo over here and this guy was blah, 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 right? There, there are things that we can use for clinical education purposes, but it doesn't allow for the repeating of their name or any of that protected health information, right? Protective health information being their name, social security number, addresses, any of that, we won't discuss that. But you can put it on your billing forms because obviously the agency has a need to know. I think this is the first review question. And I'm just gonna run through the first one here, but again, know that these are all available on your PowerPoints. So the first one, which is, uh, which of the following is an example of care as providing using standing orders, right? Talk a little about standing orders. Standing orders are things you can do before you contact the hospital, right? There's our definition. So medical control is contacted. Oh no, right? I know right away just by reading that first part, but always read the rest of the question just to make sure. So medical control is contacted by the EMT after a patient with chest pain refuses EMS care. That's bad, by the way. So we don't want anything to do with A. B, the EMT defibrillates a cardiac arrest patient, begins CPR, and then contacts meds control. That sounds like a winner. But to make sure, I'm going to go through my other two options. A physician uh, gives the EMT an order via radio to administer oral glucose to a diabetic patient. Okay, that's not a standing order. Following an overdose, the EMT contacts the medical director for permission to give activated charcoal. Again, following an overdose. So which one of these things is different? Well, it's this one. The EMT defibrillates a cardiac arrest patient, begins CPR, and then contacts meds control, right? So standing orders are those algorithms that you have in place to deal with the patient, and then at a time where it's more appropriate to do so, right? Why would I be on the phone if my guy's in cardiac and I rest? And I know within the first two minutes, CPR and AED will automatically increase their chances of survival. So it does go through, it gives you the answer, it gives you the rationale. And what's also cool about this is notice that you can see why A is not the right answer, we see the correct answer, and then you again, this is an example of online. This is an example of online. So that's where I went to where, which one of these things is different. So those are on each of the chapters for you. Again, feel free to go through those. I encourage you all to do that. But this concludes the chapter one EMS systems. If there's questions, again, you will all have ways to contact us when, when the time comes. But I uh, hope you enjoyed chapter one. There's some more exciting things coming your way for a total of 40 more chapters like this. So thanks again.